Hello and welcome to my talk. My name is David Čermák and my topic for today is about validation of the TCPIP stack on the embedded device. So now let me decompose this title into a validation of something on embedded devices. And this practically defines the first part of the talk, which would address not only validation, but also verification in general on embedded devices. Uh, let's now focus on this something which we are going to validate. Uh, it's your TCPIP stack. So uh, not a network stack in general, but the exact one, uh, the one that is used on the device and that is compiled, linked and flashed into the system. So uh, these are basically two topics which I'm going to talk about. Uh, but uh, uh, before going ahead, uh, let me briefly introduce myself. I am an embedded developer uh, at Espressive Systems. I frequently commit to Espressive uh, repositories um, ESPIDF, uh, this is the official development framework for IoT, and also to some other expressive repositories, uh, for example ESPMQTT or ESPLWIP, and this is again the official expressive network stack, or uh, better said its fork, uh, because we use LWIP or lightweight IP, and this is practically an industry standard for many other uh, microcontrollers and smaller devices. Uh, my main area of interest uh, at Espressive is in networking and protocols. And this perfectly matches uh, the network stack testing and patching as well. And uh, of course, this is the subject of the talk. And also the reason uh, for having this contribution, because it talks about what we do, or perhaps what we should do at Espressive in this subject. Uh, this is, I think, very important to highlight that users of the ESP platform and the products could benefit from these techniques, as the actual design of uh, IoT system could be implemented and tuned on a developer machine, uh, not even touching the actual chip. Not only expressive chips, but also other platforms uh, for IoT and other vendors solve the same problems, of validating their network stacks. So sharing uh, methods, uh, issues, and especially patches is es essential here. Uh, for example, uh, some, uh, some of the conformance tests that I'm going to show later uh, are, are developed at Intel, and we run, the, uh, run them and call them Intel NetSuite, and run them on expressive chips. Uh, links and credits are shared in the last slide. Um, with uh, other references. Uh, so this was uh, about me and now uh, let's get back to the talk and this is the agenda of, uh, uh, of this uh, presentation and surprisingly it is uh, divided into these two sections which uh, the title talks about. First part is a more general, uh, more general one uh, we are going to look into uh, the common methods embedded people uh, typically use for testing and debugging and most importantly uh, we could compare and contrast them especially when talking about testing internals of the TCPIP stack. Second part is uh, a bit more, more practical one and I would uh, give here specific examples and lessons learned on different methods used for testing. And uh, here I would talk about conformance tests. So basically, uh, if a specific protocol implementation complies with the standard. And the second example, uh, I would give a, a different example on using fuzzer techniques uh, for finding issues and, and uh, design flaws. Uh, implementation flaws uh, in specific protocol implementations. So let's move on to the first section and uh, here are basically the options which we typically use for testing, uh, debugging, analyzing, reproducing issues, regression, CI, uh, simply everything uh, related to development uh, on embedded systems. So we could basically 
test on the real device, or we could recompile the thing that we test to a different platform uh, and, and run it on, on the developer's machine. And we can also do something in between. We can use an emulator, so a computer program that emulates the target platform. Let me mention here that uh, uh, as, as an emulator, we use uh, the QMU for ESP platform. And this is an open source emulator and virtualizer, uh, which is also widely used in other projects and fields. So uh, here we run the target platform uh, practically as a virtual machine on the developer's PC. So now let's uh, go to the target tests. Uh, testing something on the real device under the exactly same conditions that are used in the production or in the field. Uh, here um, we have an application or test application uh, sending the packets and expecting some responses uh, or timeouts. On the other side, we have the genuine target device running the exact application and the software stack under test, which in our case is the highlighted box of the TCP IP stack. Uh, well, since every engineer is partly a natural scientist or used to be one when he or she was a child, I would like to compare this method to so-called in vivo experiment, or in other words, in, li in, in the real life experiment, where we have the subject under test, which is this little rabbit, and we inject a TCP packet into it, and we watch it, watch its behavior, to see if it is what we expect. This rabbit is in fact, uh, in fact our TCP IP stack under test, which runs in its natural environment living on top of the exact same software layers and running on the exactly same bytecode and silicon as if it were if it were in the fields. Another method, host tests. Uh, exactly, exactly the opposite method, uh, quite far from the real life. This setup is what embedded people usually call host tests. Uh, the device uh, under test or its part, the part of our interest, runs as a computer program on the same machine as the test application. Here it is the only source code which is the same as in the previous setup. So basically we recompile the portion of the code that uh, we test uh, into a different platform and run it under that platform. And again, Looking at this method uh, with uh, uh, scientists' eyes, uh, we might call this uh, in vitro experiment, uh, which means in the glass experiment. So extracting only the fragments of our interest, put them into a chemical glass and uh, make all kinds of experiments on, uh, uh, on it using all available laboratory equipment and uh, this is the main benefit of this method. We can use all the tooling for analyzing, debugging, profiling, validation, and uh, do everything uh, what, we, uh, what we like to experiment on much more advanced, faster, and platform, uh, like uh, feature richer platform than the platform of our real target. So we are in fact in the lab crammed with modern tools and equipment. Using an emulator is something in between. It is actually a host test per se, but the program under test runs in its original form, compiled for the original tar target platform and runs practically hosted inside a virtual machine. This method would scientists uh, probably call in situ, which means in its original place, as the TCP test, TCP stack under test, runs uh, kind of in the matrix of the original environment, executing its genuine machine code, and at the same time we are still in the lab, so we are on the platform rich on tooling and equipment. 
and here comes uh, probably the most important slide of my talk. Practical comparison of uh, these, method, uh, these methods and practical recommendations. Host tests are good approximation for most scenarios uh, where we check for security issues, array overflows, wrap around variables, writing behind the array, as well as conformance testing, protocol related issues. Target tests are essential for testing uh, the timing issues, race conditions or driver related issues or checking on the exact reports by customers who provide steps to reproduce on the target device. Target tests are not very suitable for automations. For automation uh, tests uh, in the CI where we require very good stability and robustness of the test. Emulator tests are very useful everywhere where we have to use the target platform and we still want to benefit from the host platform. Uh, example could be, uh, let's say, port related issues uh, since the port layers are different in the host tests. Uh, again, uh, the emulator uh, is uh, very useful, but uh, the number one choice for 99% of use cases are, in my experience, and uh, related to testing network stacks, uh, these are host tests, as they are fast, they are reliable, robust, and provide good enough approximation for validating protocols. One example where the host test would not help, and this is this one remaining percent of use cases, is where I would suggest using an emulator. And uh, I will give an example of one recent issues that we had, uh, and this is this uh, TCP close, uh, close refused issue. Uh, so this is an example of the issue where the TCP IP stack receives input packets the input processing runs in a separate thread and the data are posted to a queue. This queue is of course of a limited size and um, especially on the target platform. Nevertheless, uh, the stack handles queue overflows correctly uh, and uh, this, this works perfectly for data packets uh, because this is the usual case. The problem comes when the queued message is not a data packet but just a flag uh, and in this case it is a thin flag uh, indicating the connection closure and this is uh, actually very very unlikely case and uh, this is not handled proper properly so we may, may end up in half open half closed connection and at this uh, um, this is actually the problem uh, that we had and it could only be uh, reproduced on either the real device because we need to use the real port layers or using an emulator. And this slide uh, actually concludes the first part of my talk, listing benefits and drawbacks of these methods, which we've already discussed and explained. Uh, let me just mention here that in case for a host test, we generally need to port the code uh, to the host platform in the first place, and this might not be a trivial task. Also, running the targets inside an emulator, um, we may experience some subtle differences in timing, and when talking about the TCP IP stack, the I.O. device or the driver to this uh, I.O. device, so, so the device which is sending packets to and fro, uh, is generally different. Uh, now let's move forward to the second part of the talk, giving specific examples on TCP IP stack tests. Uh, the first one talks about uh, conformance testing using TTC and 3 engine where I would briefly introduce the workflow on the TTCN3 and explain why it is so important and useful and would describe the environment and uh, lastly give specific example. Uh, so, 
This is the official homepage of uh, the DTCN3, uh, and uh, yeah, this acronym stands for Testing and Test Control Notation Version 3. And this is an example of the test case uh, written in that language, similar to what I have shown uh, in the pictures about the different test setups. This test case actually sends a SYN packet and expect SYN and acknowledge packet. Uh, and if, if we receive one, we pass the test, otherwise we set the verdict to fail. As you can see, uh, this is a very simple language, useful for testing protocols. Even though it's so nice and simple, you may ask why we need yet another language to write our test cases. To answer this, uh, let me open another web page. This is uh, the Titan Core implementation of its compiler on, on GitHub. And uh, this is the nice thing about TTCN3, that it perfectly isolates the module from the port and from the platform. So the test case itself is uh, perfectly platform and IO agnostic. So uh, that we can we can easily reuse uh, the implementation of the protocol. And this is an example of the protocol modules which are implemented in TTCN3 and are available here. Going back to our example, here is the test setup for uh, our conformance testing. Uh, you can clearly see uh, that uh, this is a target test. Also, not 100% the target test I've shown before, since the input and output media to pass packets uh, to and from is a bit different, because we convert uh, this uh, uh, network data into a byte stream and pass them using standard input and standard output of the board uh, to, to the test application and back to the board. Uh, the reason uh, for, for doing it this way was uh, because of some historical reasons and uh, we already plan to refactor this setup to a, to a standard host test. Uh, So this setup helped us uh, identif uh, identify certain issues uh, or certain cases and scenarios where the LWIP did not comply to the specs. Uh, all of these valuations were just, uh, let's say, corner cases uh, when the other part of the uh, connection, the other endpoint, sends something unexpected. As an example of uh, such a corner case, I'm showing an issue when the sender sends a packet with uh, no flex set up, uh, no flex at all, uh, no TCP uh, flex set, uh, the correct reaction should be like completely ignoring this scenario. But the LWIP fell into its default case and uh, was actually sending an RST. And this is this is a uh, like a simple way to to fix this. Uh, all right, so that was the conformance test, and now uh, let's move on to the second example, uh, which is using fuzzer techniques for finding issues and vulnerabilities in the TCPIP stack. We run these examples as host test and use AFL for fuzzing. Uh, AFL stands for American Fuzzy Lob, and it's uh, one of uh, the smart fuzzers. Uh, actually, which are actually fuzzers that use some guidance to uh, and, and use code, uh, code coverage uh, uh, as a feedback to exercise the input vectors. Therefore, the tested source code has to be uh, implemented. And this is an example uh, of uh, our execution uh, on uh, the DHCP server uh, on, on, on IDF. Again, links are shared in uh, as, as uh, in the, in the last slide with, with other references. And um, let me just mention here uh, that AFL provides this uh, nice table about all the statistics and, and uh, results. But what, what is important here from um, our point of view is that uh, this is actually the DHCP server uh, that we test uh, because this is uh, an expressive implementation. Uh, it's not part of LWIP, so, so we have to test it properly. Uh, 
uh, LWIP itself uh, uh, has some uh, kind of fuzzing, and we we also test some some other uh, some other uh, components of uh, LWIP using this father, but uh, this is probably the most important uh, test that we that we have here. And now uh, let's switch to an example of uh, a typical issue found found by fuzzing. So uh, here we just use an error rather than assert. So actually converting this uh, case from unreal to something that could happen under some circumstances. Uh, but uh, we just uh, uh, drop the packet, return an error, uh, write some error message to, to the console and uh, continue uh, rather than completely crash the system. And now uh, we are moving towards the end of the talk. So here are the links and the references to the examples that I have shown and the tools that we used in the presentations. Uh, so this is just uh, for, for the reference. And you can actually uh, run all the tests, uh, at least these two examples uh, and, and uh, also other, te uh, other tests related to these uh, following the... Uh, following the uh, the links uh, provided here. And finally, let me conclude uh, this talk uh, with uh, uh, these three uh, three words of summary. So, if you are working on embedded device and uh, on some network protocol related task, just try to compile it on the host. It will be faster and it will be easier and um, it would be a good approximation for the task. If you are using ESP32, check out the QMU. It's an easy and convenient method to run it inside your Linux or macOS or, or Windows machine. If you are testing conformance uh, to certain protocol, check out the TTCN3 language and its implementation and chances are that the test case is already implemented and you can simply reuse it. And this is all from me. Uh, thank you for your attention. Check out the links and references and if you find some of this uh, technique useful, uh, please try to, try to use it. Thank you again and see you.